Hello, my name is Mark Gibson, and you're listening to the podcast version of the Chagask Signpost series, a weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. The Chagask Marginal Abatement Cost Curve, also known as the MAC, is central to Ireland's strategy to reducing gaseous emissions from agriculture. To explain the science that underpins the MAC, I'm delighted to be joined by Professor Gary Lanigan, who leads the Gaseous Emission Research Group at Chagas Johnstown Castle. He's a member of the UN Expert Panel on the Mitigation of Agricultural Nitrogen and is an advisor to the EPA's Climate Change Research Programme. Gary, you're very welcome to our programme today. Thank you very much, Mark. Gary, I'm just going to switch to your video there and we should be able to see you. Okay. Um, Okay. So, Gary, um, you're going to give us a 25 minute presentation on uh, the, the, the latest developments on gaseous emissions. If I could hand over to you, Gary, and uh, hope everything runs smoothly for us today. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mark. What I'm talking about today is Chagask's marginal abatement cost curve. And basically, for those of you that don't know it, it is merely <clears throat> a marginal abatement cost curve is, is really just a way to rank measures, okay? So what we've done is we've um, looked at the 28 most uh, likely measures that we can use to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions and also reduce ammonia emissions. Um, And what we've done is ranked them both in terms of the amount of mitigation they can do and also um, the costings of those measures, okay? So it's essentially a cost benefit analysis. Okay, you would have heard uh, any of those of you that have been uh, at the other series of uh, lectures on this by John Muldowney et al, that um, agriculture really has a number of different challenges uh, facing it at the moment. First of all, the industry is expanding to meet global food demand. Um, The FAO predict Uh, that there will be a sustained demand for dairy and meat products over the next uh, coming years up to 2050, okay, as population grows and also as populations in developing countries um, become uh, more wealthy. On top of this, not only do we have, does industry have um, uh, uh, an expectation to increase both in terms of value and in terms of volume uh, as as being laid down by, first of all, food harvest and then food waste 2030. Um, We also have to reduce our greenhouse gas and ammonia emissions. So unlike or or very, uh, we're a real outlier in terms of the EU, in terms of the EU. Um, Most EU countries about, nine to ten percent of their greenhouse gas emissions are from agriculture. A third of our greenhouse gas emissions uh, stem from agriculture and 98 percent virtually all our ammonia emissions also arise from agriculture. Okay and this is uh, twofold. First of all we don't have a whole lot of heavy industry to dilute our uh, agricultural emissions unlike other EU countries and also we have a preponderance of livestock. Um, so our greenhouse gas emissions are dominated by methane um, from uh, ruminants, from enteric fermentation, and nitrous oxide uh, arising from animals urinating and defecating on pasture, and also from fertilizer application. And in terms of our agricultural targets, so we have our food wise and food harvest uh, production targets, but we also have agricultural uh, 2030 targets. So the, under the government's climate action plan, we have to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture by 10%. And for the wider economy, uh, as part of the, the EU's 2030 targets, um, we need to reduce uh, our greenhouse gas emissions from the entire state by 30% by 2030. So this is quite an onerous target. Um, particularly because we're actually um, we're actually 
already behind the curve. So we narrowly missed our 2020 target. So we're already playing catch up uh, for our 2030 targets. And just to uh, bear in mind that the 2030 targets are a multi-year target. So you don't do all your mitigation in 2030. You have to have ongoing mitigation between 2020 and 2030. Um, so we have challenges both in terms of reducing emissions and also in trying to deliver carbon sequestration to offset emissions, which I'll come back to later. In terms of our ammonia targets, we're already in breach of our ammonia uh, uh, ceilings under the National Emission Ceiling Directive. Um, we have a 1% reduction target from 2020 to 2030 and 5% from 2030 onwards. So in this context, what you're going to find is that there will be increasing political pressure on agriculture to reduce its environmental impact. And particularly as other parts of the economy decarbonize, such as transport, residential emissions, etc., what you will find is that a larger proportion of the uh, residual emissions left behind will probably uh, derive from the agriculture and land use sectors. Okay. But again, there is uh, increasing political pressure, both in terms of the EU's Green Deal, uh, emphasis, an increasing emphasis on plant based diets, um, planning permissions up in Northern Ireland being refused due to ammonia emissions. So there's, there's a, 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 an environmental context which is gathering pace really with this. And ultimately, the, uh, the government hopes to achieve carbon neutrality is our long-term goal, carbon neutrality for uh, the whole of the state by 2050. Okay, so if we, if you're going to run a marginal abatement cost curve and you're going to try and um, uh, project what happens with agriculture into the, into the future, the first thing we have to do is uh, project what agricultural activity will be, will be like, okay? And we basically had uh, three scenarios. So the S1, which was our um, soft Brexit baseline scenario, the uh, S2, which was a hard Brexit uh, low activity scenario, and S3, which is a high activity scenario. So basically the difference between uh, these three uh, scenarios is that for the top scenario, there's about 1.8 million dairy cows, uh, 1.6 million dairy cows in the bottom scenario, and the suckler herd uh, then has uh, different sizes with, with all of these three. So the S2 uh, hard Brexit scenario would see about a halving of the suckler herd. The S1, slightly lower uh, number of suckler animals, about 800,000 um, than, uh, currently, uh, than we currently have. And S3 would see uh, no real decrease in suckler herd. Okay. So under these three scenarios, and concomitant with this, there's also then increases in fertilizer usage as you have increases in, in, um, in, herd, in herd size and the size of the national herd. And what you see because of this uh, increase in animal numbers or change in animal numbers for the different scenarios, you see three very different trajectories um, of what, the, uh, what our, our baseline figures might be under the S1, S2, and S3 scenarios. So you're looking at a spread of somewhere uh, just short of 2 million tons between the top and the bottom scenario. And just to show where we need to be, um, we need to be under the, the Climate Action Plan somewhere between 17 and a half and 19 million tons, okay? So if we look at our ammonia emissions then, Again, we also see a consequence of those different levels of activity uh, in the projections on our ammonia emissions. And just to show um, where we need to be, um, the 112.2 is our 2020 uh, 20 to 2030 target, and the 107.7 uh, tons is um, our uh, 2030 5% uh, reduction target. Okay, so as you can see, particularly if we're following close to 
the S3 high activity scenario, we've a, we've a lot of ground to make up. Gary, can I just clarify yeah. that they, those scenarios are without any mitigation? They're without any mitigation. They are business as usual scenarios without any mitigation. Correct. Thanks. So um, if we then look at uh, what, what is a MAC, a marginal abatement cost curve? Well, simply it's a graph that ranks uh, your measures. Okay. The width of the bar indicates the abatement potential of an individual measure. So the wider the bar, the more effective it is at reducing either greenhouse gases or ammonia. The bar height indicates the cost. So negative values, everything below the, the, the line uh, indicates a cost saving, um, whereas uh, everything above the line is an actual cost. So the, the taller the bars, the more expensive they are. Okay, and then the hatched line across signifies the mean cost of abatement or, uh, on a greenhouse gas, ton of greenhouse gas abated or ton of ammonia abated. Okay, so that's a, 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 a quick explanation as to the, uh, as to the actual uh, graphs. So if we look at the solutions that we looked at, first of all, um, our strategy was to reduce methane by efficiency measures. That was utilize uh, measures that would reduce the carbon footprint of a liter of milk or a kilo of beef. And that was mainly around things like animal genetics, finishing times, um, uh, optimizing output per head, extended grazing, uh, improved animal health, and also some dietary changes. The second, uh, the second are, um, set of our strategies was around nitrogen okay and nutrient use and really that focuses on two things first of all uh, reducing nitrogen input as much as possible that by improving nitrogen use efficiency either through uh, appropriate liming and appropriate uh, uh, good soil status um, and also by the things by the use of clover um, but also by changing fertilizer formulation, okay? So really reduce nitrogen where possible. And if you can't reduce the amount of mineral nitrogen, change the type of mineral nitrogen you apply. And um, also uh, we had uh, strategies on manure. Um, so uh, putting in additives that can reduce ammonia and methane, and also by applying uh, your slurry with a low emission uh, slurry spreading uh, technique. Um, uh, that will A, reduce greenhouse gas and ammonia emissions, and B, will improve the, the nitrogen fertilizer replacement value of your slurry, which in turn means you then need to apply less mineral fertilizer, okay? But concomitant with all of these solutions that I'm going to show you now is the underlying uh, need for effective knowledge transfer. Unless we get effective knowledge transfer, then all these mitigation options that are laid out in the MAC are merely notional. Okay, so if we look at agricultural mitigation, what we see is the main options that are most effective are uh, dairy EBI, so improving the genetic merit of the dairy herd, Changing fertilizer type, you see is a nice wide bar as well. Um, and also the use of things like um, low emission spreading, um, slurry amendments, animal health, extended grazing. Okay, changes in um, reducing crude protein in pig diets. Uh, the use of clover, and here the, the use of lime to improve nitrogen use efficiency and, and soil nutrient cycling. So, Basically, when we crunched all these together, um, what, what, we, what we came up with was that um, assuming linear uptake of these measures over the 10 year period, that you would be able to mitigate slightly under 2 million tons, 1.85 million tons. And by 2030, we would be reaching a maximum mitigation of 3 million tons per year. Um, and that's assuming that we get good uptake in a lot of these measures. So for example, 
we're assuming that we could apply clover uh, to 20% of beef farms at least and 15% of dairy farms. For nitrogen use efficiency, about a third of our soils are uh, not at the right pH. Uh, and so if we can, even if we can get half of those soils back up to optimal pH, um, what you do then is you're saving about 70 kilos of nitrogen per hectare per year simply by uh, having your soil at the appropriate uh, pH level. The two biggest measures are dairy EBI um, and the fertil and fertilizer type, which I'll come on to in a minute. The one thing uh, I will say, and I'll just give a little bit of warning about some of these efficiency measures, is that the savings in terms of greenhouse gases um, are notional. Um, particularly if you have a rising animal population. What these measures do is they dampen the amount of greenhouse gases per, uh, per animal or per head for every extra animal you have, but they won't eliminate them. And in fact, if some of these measures like dairy EBI uh, and some of the beef measures are, are profitable, you can end up with a rebound effect, whereas as your farm becomes more profitable, you end up having more activity and your greenhouse gas emissions can in fact go up, okay? So that's just a health warning with those measures. So rather than show it on a, on a um, fully on a, a, tab on a gra graphical format, I've tabulated out uh, the main um, the main winners here in terms of the measures that we have. So protected urea, dairy EBI, uh, low emission slurry spreading, uh, draining wet mineral soils. These are all measures that uh, are quite effective. And in particular, the low emission slurry spreading is also very effective over here uh, in terms of ammonia measures. In fact, amongst the ammonia measures, um, moving to low emission spreading and protected urea make up the, va the vast bulk of the mitigation actions that we can do. So they, they are really no brainers in terms of, uh, in terms of mitigation measures. And um, we also have two other uh, different types of MACs as well. So we looked at agricultural measures, but we also looked at land use, land use change in forestry. So these are, instead of reducing emissions, we're offsetting emissions by sucking up more CO2 out of the atmosphere. And really the big options here are forestry, um, water table management of organic soils. So these are organic soils that are in agricultural production um, that have probably previously been arterially uh, drained in the 60s and 70s uh, and 80s. Uh, and some of those drains might already be stopped up but some of them uh, we, might, we might want to re-wet. Um, pasture management and tillage management then makes up the rest of the, this carbon sequestration uh, tranche of uh, emissions and emission savings. Um, and then finally, we have the bioenergy me measures, which don't, the savings don't necessarily accrue to the agricultural sector, but agriculture is still contributing uh, to the decarbonisation of the wider Irish economy. So really here, it's um, the likes of wood biomass for energy, biogas uh, and biomethane um, that are going to uh, offer the, uh, the, 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 biggest, the biggest savings. Okay. Gary, just had a quick question there. Just maybe you could explain what EBI is uh, for, for those, some of the viewers. Okay. So um, the dairy uh, EBI is the Economic Breeding Index. And really what it is, is it's an index of, um, it's an index of the uh, amount of, of, of the value of uh, your, um, of your dairy system and your dairy cow per, um, per greenhouse gas emissions produced. Um, so really what the, what the EBI uh, is doing is selecting for uh, higher genetic merit animals on the dairy side and on the beef side as well with the beef quality assurance scheme. Um, so basically it's, 
it's an index that incentivizes um, a higher, either a higher amount of milk per head or a lower uh, need for replacement animals. Perfect. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an index, uh, it's an economic index of, uh, of um, uh, dairy milk production. And Gary, we have one more question here. SRC, uh, just a quick definition of that. The SRC is short rotation coppicing. So uh, that's uh, the use of willow primarily um, for uh, burning for either heat production or electricity production in a combined heat and power plant. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Gary. Okay. okay. So I'm going to focus in on a couple of these uh, um, a couple of these measures and the big measure across both the ammonia side of things and the greenhouse gas side of things is actually optimizing uh, your farm nitrogen use okay and minimizing the use of chemical uh, chemical nitrogen fertilizer where where appropriate okay and this is a slide from Patrick Forrestal and um, basically what it shows is why fertilizer formulation is an important um, an important strategy for us to look at. Okay, so what you see is that ammonia emissions from unprotected urea are much much higher than for can or protected urea. But in terms of greenhouse gases, you can see that nitrous oxide emissions are highest for calcium ammonium nitrate compared to protected urea, protected urea and unprotected urea. Okay, so what does this tell us? First of all, um, where possible to reduce the amount of nitrogen being used, okay? And how will that happen? Well, by moving to, for example, low slurry spreading techniques, you will save a certain amount of nitrogen that will go up into the air. If you splash plate apply uh, slurry, you, you can lose between 50 and 90% of the nitrogen in that slurry. So by moving to a low emissions, um, a low emissions technique, you're going to be saving maybe, you know, uh, an extra um, 30 to 40 percent of that slurry that, or slurry nitrogen that would have disappeared off into the atmosphere. The use of clover, um, if done judiciously, uh, again will probably uh, offset the need for nitrogen by about 70 to 80 uh, kilos of nitrogen per hectare per year. Um, and also then um, good, uh, good management of your soils in terms of liming and in terms of your pea, your pea status um, uh, will then reduce your need for nitrogen. So again, in soils, if you bring soil up from pH 5.5 to uh, 6.8, um, you basically can release about 70 kilos of nitrogen and two and a half kilos of phosphorus per hectare per year. Okay, so you then reduce the need, but, but what we need to see is we need to see on farms actual reductions then in the amount of mineral fertilizer being put on when we use these techniques. There's no uh, point, for example, uh, going uh, and using uh, a trailing shoe or a trailing hose machine for slurry spreading and then still putting on the same amount of mineral nitrogen that was being put on before. Okay, so we have to manage uh, our nitrogen use and where we can't manage our nitrogen use, then we need to uh, think about changing over, particularly from unprotected urea to protected urea in the first instance, because that's a, a huge saving um, for us on our ammonia emissions. And then subsequent to that, um, moving some of our uh, calcium ammonium nitrate to protected urea uh, in order to reduce our nitrous oxide emissions. Okay, the next bit I'll come to is forestry and land use. So under uh, the flexibilities that we have uh, afforded in the EU 2030 targets, we can um, bank just under 27 million tonnes um, that's 2.68 million tons per year by enhancing what's called carbon sinks. Okay, um, and that is basically uh, sucking up CO2 and locking it either a in the soil, 
or B in woody uh, biomass, be it in trees or in hedgerows. And Ireland were given uh, quite a generous flexibility um, uh, under, under this plan, but there is actually huge scope for Ireland to actually elect more sequestration, particularly both in the forestry section and the organic soil section, but also in grasslands and in croplands. And just one word, word of warning um, as I carry on, our forestry sink uh, which currently is contributing uh, just over 2 million tonnes uh, of mitigation um, won't last forever unless we get our, printing, our, our planting rates up. So this is, these are model runs using a uh, model called Carbware. And what this shows is that for different planting rates, you have a different size of a sink, okay? But the thing to notice is that under the lowest planting rate, three and a half thousand hectares per year, which is roughly what the planting rate is uh, at the moment, um, that our carbon sink in forestry falls off a cliff uh, somewhere just after 2030. And that's simply because our rate of deforestation at some point will uh, overtake our rate of afforestation. And that's because we actually planted a lot of our forestry uh, between 1990 and 2000 or so. So that cohort of, uh, of tree stands are coming towards maturity um, around about ne uh, in the next 10 years or so. Okay. Harry, I just have a question yeah. here that uh, came in. I thought it might be a good time to ask it. It's, it's asked yeah. here, is there a crossover between forestry and wood biomass? Are the figures including biomass production from forestry uh, separate uh, or if separate what area of biomass would be needed to deliver 0.76 megatons of co2 equivalents so the so the 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 woody biomass for heat production um is really things like uh, sawdust and thinnings from our current stock um however uh, there is a difference in that our miscanthus and uh, short rotation coppicing uh, figures are are separate to forestry, so they're they're separate. Okay. Um, I just want to spend a couple of minutes uh, explaining carbon sequestration here because it is something that's quite um, uh, misunderstood, I think. So when we talk about carbon sequestration, like I said, that can either be carbon locked in trees and woody biomass and in hedgerows or in soils, okay? And the amount of carbon in soils is influenced really by two different things. First of all, the type of, of soil that you have. So a light soil um, will have a very small sink, okay? So it will have a much smaller capacity to lock in carbon. And if you have a, a crop uh, on that, because that crop is highly disturbed and also there's a fallow period, you have a lot of CO2 being taken up by that crop, but you also have a lot of CO2 leaving the system. So in cropland situations, we tend to uh, see carbon in general leaving those systems. If we take a, a clay soil, which has a larger sink and a larger capacity to bind carbon to it, um, that has a larger capacity to, to, to bind carbon. And what you would find then in a grassland, for example, so grassland as well has high CO2 uptake. And the more uh, efficiently you grow your grass, so anything that makes you improve your yield should in theory also improve your soil carbon sequestration. So what you see is that the uptake is high and because though it's a permanent system, the losses tend to be lower. So there's less respiration, less decomposition in these systems. So you get your carbon levels going up in grasslands. And then we have peat soils. And for this purpose, I have the carbon sink as a swimming pool compared to a, a, a basin. So in a tillage soil, you typically get uh, values of about 80 to 100 tons of carbon per hectare. Um, in a peat soil, it's more uh, 700 to 1,000 
um, tons of carbon per hectare. So these peat soils, in fact, have been described as our rainforests because there is a huge amount of carbon, a thousand tons of carbon per hectare per, uh, uh, locked away in these soils. And these soils have low CO2 uptake, but it's like a sink with a plug in, nothing really leaves it. So they are really the, the soils that we have to focus on maintaining uh, carbon stocks. And another thing just to mention is that carbon sequestration is finite. Okay, so you go from um, one uh, land, you say a cropland to a grassland, um, and eventually your carbon levels will top out. Okay, it is also reversible. And the rule of thumb is that you lose carbon six times quicker than you gain it back. Okay. And then we come to the issue about how it's counted. So people go on or talk a lot about um, us being able to count our grassland sequestration. Okay. But the problem is that we cannot count all that sequestration because what you have is you have this period here um, before uh, our baseline year, 2005 is when all our measurements are, are based against. So we have to prove a management change in our grasslands between say 2005 and now in order to, to uh, and it's this additional, it's this additional sequestration caused by the management change that we can count as grassland carbon sequestration. The amount that's been going on in perpetuity cannot be counted because it's all been going on. And this is just a slide to show that, that uh, issue that as you uh, convert a grassland to a cropland, you lose soil carbon very quickly. But when you convert a cropland back to a, a grassland, it only slowly recovers its soil carbon. And then we come to rewetting of drained peatlands, which is another one of our options. And really, this is a huge, these are huge hotspots of emissions where you drain peat soils and you introduce air into those, uh, those soils. And like I said, those soils have 700 to 1000 tons of uh, carbon per hectare. Um, you emit somewhere between 16 and 30 tons of CO2 per hectare per year. So we've calculated that rewetting 40,000 hectares of this will offset just under half a million tons of CO2 per year. So a relatively small area uh, that would need to be rewetted for quite a large offset. But ultimately, all these measures that are in the macro are um, notional um, at best on unless we can get implementation on the ground. So we need to see um, implementation of uh, good soil nutrient practice, of low emission spreading technologies, of improving the genetic merit and the health of our bovines, um, reducing the crude protein content of our pig diets, um, uh, changing um, how our attitude to nitrogen fertilizer uh, and improving, uh, reducing our farm end surpluses. And then also uh, really um, looking at landscape uh, solutions. Um, so can we plant a row of trees that might intercept ammonia or intercept nitrate uh, going down to a watercourse and those trees as well will, will um, will capture carbon, carbon and improve carbon uh, sequestration. Um, so we need a, 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 a real renewal of the, the, the link between research, uh, advisory and on the ground implementation of these measures. Because without on the ground implementation of the measures, we will not reach any of our targets. So, uh, you know, advisory is absolutely key. Harry, we have a question here from uh, somebody who's asking, is there a simple tool developed for farms to evaluate their emission levels uh, based on their practices? 
Okay, so we have a we have a carbon navigator um, that will be uh, getting uh, overhauled. Um, so in the first instance, I would say the carbon navigator. Um, ultimately, I think uh, the way ahead for us is going to be to have the, the have pasture base and NMP online need to link into a carbon accounting tool, be it the carbon navigator or something else. Um, and that uh, then ultimately would be the, the, um, the on-farm tool uh, that farmers would use. So um, in, the in, in the first instance, yes, we do have the carbon navigator um, and hopefully uh, we'll, be, uh, we'll be overhauling that fairly soon. So in summary, we have a, a, a lot of challenges, um, you know, uh, we have targets both in terms of greenhouse gas emissions and ammonia emissions. Um, the cap has, of course, increased environmental focus, and there is increased environmental regulation, both EU and national, you know, uh, coming, coming, coming on screen. Okay. Um, there's also going to be challenges in the future uh, with price volatility. You know, we've got, we've got challenges at the moment with COVID and probably with Brexit coming down, coming down the line, um, which is going to introduce a, a level of economic uncertainty in the short to medium term. Um, and also society's expectation for, for the stewardship and management of the land is, is changing as well. Significant mitigation potential exists. That's, that's my final uh, take home point, but these only exist at the moment on paper. Um, there is significant advisory communication and act action required by all of the stakeholders across the entire um, farm to fork value chain. Okay, so this is a, a needs a joint effort uh, from scientists, from advisors, from farmers, and from also from industry, um, and particularly. The focus really for most of the MAC measures is at farm level to reduce these emissions, you know, and behavioral change, again, particularly uh, in relation to land use, uh, land management, um, and also uh, um, soil husbandry and nitrogen husbandry uh, needs, to, needs to change in a significant way. And Finally, we do then also need diversification and land use optimization. So again, uh, instead of just thinking of these things on a field basis or a farm basis, we need to actually think of a lot of these um, solutions um, on a landscape basis. Okay, so it's not necessarily, for example, a forestry plantation. It might be there might be a little bit of agroforestry or a line of trees or or different options um, that that fit into the context of where you are on the landscape. Are you near a watercourse, for example, um, or are you on a hillside or, or, or whatever? But the, again, we do need good land use uh, optimization to put the appropriate uh, land management and land use in the appropriate place. And ultimately, we need to have integrated sustainability measures that also incorporate water quality and biodiversity because there is no use in uh, fixing one problem and making another problem worse. Okay, and uh, and probably the the, the obvious uh, um, example of that would be while well, Sitka spruce, um, for example, is good at sequestering carbon. Uh, it's not necessarily ideal for biodiversity, um, and and or water quality, depend on where it's put. So. Um, we do also have to uh, keep in mind uh, the, these other environmental um, criterion uh, when we're drawing up sustainability measures. And that's it. Thank you very much. That's great, Gary. Thank you very much for that. And that's a really good point to finish on. I mean, we, we, we really do have to keep an eye on all of the, the environmental indicators, water quality, soils, uh, biodiversity, and uh, it is a, a bit of a juggling act, really, isn't it? We need to we have to be careful about what what the consequences of of some of our measures on, on looking after the various headings. Yes, um, absolutely.
So uh, what we'll do is um, we might just, with lots and lots of questions, Gary, so um, what we'll do is we'll, we'll try and get through as many questions as possible. So if I could ask you to maybe try and be as concise as possible with your, your answers, um, if, if possible. I know, look, this is a complex area, so, um, so there should be a few, a few fairly quick ones. But I, I mean, there was a general question there that was asked there about the Coyote pro Protocol. Mm. Uh, is this the best and only option available to Ireland? It's, you know, well, yeah, we, we've kind of gone beyond the Kyoto Protocol. So the Kyoto Protocol in its first iteration uh, ran up to um, 2012. Uh, and then the, six, just the, the iterations since then have essentially been EU level. Mm -hmm. um, so we had our 20% 20, 20, 20 reduction by 2020. Uh, targets and now our 30% reduction by 2030. So, um, uh, are th they're the only option in town at the moment. You know, there are EU directives, we've signed up to them. Um, you know, uh, so we have to meet them in, in, in some way. We, you know, we're obliged to. Okay. Um, do you think that in the next few years that the targets for agriculture might be increased to values of 30% or more, similar to what other sectors are being asked to do? Um, I, would, I would imagine, well, they're not going to go down, let's put it that way. So uh, I think it's inevitable that they're only going to get more onerous. Um, at what level uh, they might cap out at um, is a movable feast. But, uh, inevitably, uh, they will get uh, much more onerous, yes. Okay, very good. Um, what would the impact of speeding up the adoption rate of measures like protected urea on the total amount of abatement between 2020 and 2030, i.e. The, the maximum abatement potential? Yeah, okay. So, um, so uh, basically, if you look at all the measures together, if you if you assume linear linear uptake, we were uh, uh, we were estimating 1.85 million tons. That was the average mitigation per year, assuming linear uptake. And um, were you to magically be able to uh, implement all those measures at their full adoption rate immediately, uh, it'd be three million tons mm -hmm. per year. Okay. Um, now some of those measures um, you can't uh, front end things like improving the, the genetic merit of the dairy herd, for example. That's, that's a gradual thing. Um, but some of the other measures, like as you said, the, um, uh, the uh, uh, fertilizer type, you could front end that, okay? And certainly, uh, uh, I think we've envisaged, certainly for um, ammonia emissions, we would uh, say, you know, front ending, uh, uh, the replacement of unprotected urea with protected urea uh, seems a sensible enough option to quickly reduce emissions. Okay, um, another question here. Um, all of these measures come with requiring a greater level of management ability at a farm level. Do you think the farming community is able to firstly cope with the cost of these management changes and secondly, secondly the, the decision making skills to undertake them? Um, I think it depends on the measure, uh, but uh, I think, yes, you're right to a certain degree, uh, particularly things like, um, you know, uh, appropriate, uh, uh, keeping your soil at an appropriate uh, uh, pH, and um, the introduction of clover, absolutely, uh, takes an increase in management skills, no doubt. Um, uh, so, in general, I would say, yes, they're, they're, they're there's an educational piece uh, in there for a lot of the measures um, and certainly an advisory piece for all of the measures. Mm -hmm. uh, Gary, we have a question in relation to organic farming and its mm -hmm. um, the impact on greenhouse gas emissions. I mean, how does organic farming compare with, with the conventional uh, farming in terms of its its uh, emissions. I know there's a emissions per unit uh, of product versus per hectare issue there. I imagine there there is okay. So so basically um, on uh, the the total absolute emissions from an organic farm will be lower 
than, uh, than from, say, a, conve a, a conventional farm with the same number of cows, etc. cetera. Um, what you tend to see is there tends to be uh, slightly more methane coming from those animals because there tends to be higher roughage in the diet. Um, but also, um, there tends to be, don't forget carbon, your carbon footprint is your numerator, your emissions over the amount of product you produce. So um, what tends to happen on organic farms is they've lower emissions, but they've also got a lower amount of product. So their carbon footprint doesn't necessarily get better, but their absolute emissions, yes, are, are low, will tend to be lower than, um, than a, conventional, uh, a conventional farm, because again, they're not uh, putting on mineral fertilizer. Mineral fertilizer application probably accounts to uh, for about you know a quarter uh, of the carbon footprint of uh, of that farm. We've had quite a few questions, Gary, in relation to the carbon navigator, and uh, some people are wondering where it can be accessed. I mean, it is a part of the service. Uh, I, I work with the advisory services and knowledge transfer section in Chagas. But it is a tool available uh, through agricultural advisors, uh, private and, and public. Uh, it's a collaborative tool, or a tool developed in collaboration with Board BIA. Um, now, there was a question, Gary, in relation to the Carbon Navigator as mm -hmm. to whether carbon sequestration was included in that. Uh, not, uh, the current version, I don't think it is, is it? Um, no, there, there is a small amount of carbon sequestration included in it, but uh, not really. Um, we need. That's why I was saying we need. We do need uh, uh, an overhaul of the carbon navigator to uh, be able to introduce uh, sequestration measures in. Okay. A um, few questions, Gary, in relation to minimum tillage. Um, can Gary expand on the carbon losses associated with different methods of reseeding grasslands, full till versus min till or direct till methods? Okay. So what we tend to see is that in uh, in minimum tillage systems, you tend to have uh, slightly more soil organic carbon in the top, in that plow layer, which it might be, you know, about 10 centimetres, 10 centimetres deep. Um, we don't tend to see, uh, certainly for reseeding of grassland, we don't tend to see uh, a large uh, amount of carbon loss uh, for ploughing versus min till. We don't really see it, not not for an occasional uh, reseeding of grassland if you're seeding say once every 10 years, the, the actual amount of carbon loss by ploughing relative to min till would be fairly minimal. Um, what you tend to see in um, min till systems is you have uh, slightly, you've got greater aggregate formation. Um, so the amount of protected carbon in min till systems tends to be higher in conventionally ploughed systems. Um, but uh, the difference doesn't uh, in total carbon uh, uh, stocks between uh, min till and uh, normal mold bore ploughing uh, doesn't tend to be as great as we, as we think. Okay, bring it down to field level, uh, Gary. If uh, you have a wet field that is covered in rushes, yeah. let's say three acres, uh, and drainage has failed in the past, would it be more beneficial to plant it uh, with forestry or agroforestry, or would it sequester more left as is? It, it, it would depend on the soil type uh, you were on, is the answer to that one, Mark. So if it's a, a wet mineral soil, then uh, by all means, go ahead and put a bit of forestry on it. If it's a peat soil, uh, I wouldn't go much. I would, I, I would leave the drain stocked up. Is there, uh, Gary, is there any, like, I know from speaking to, to other people in the policy side of, of uh, this, this uh, area that EBI is currently not considered uh, for, as, as part of the inventory. Is that still the case or is, um, it, is it going no, to in the future? So, no, it's not. And the, and the way we get at the reductions in EBI is what we do is we, we run our greenhouse gas models um, with animals with a, a lower EBI, uh, then run it uh, um, with animals with a higher EBI and what happens is you need less animals to produce uh, your milk target. Yeah, so that's how it works. So, so the way EBI and a lot of the efficiency measures work is they don't really work by uh, 
they don't offset, they avoid emissions by needing less cows to meet your milk production target. So it, it, what it does is it dampens the amount of emissions associated with that level of milk production. We saw in um, John Muldowney's presentation last week that there was actually a, a very strong downward tra trajectory of emissions up until uh, I suppose the quota was was uh, removed. Yeah. And John was saying that a lot of that can be attributed to those efficiency gains. Yes. So, so uh, again, the, the reductions that we saw prior to 2014 uh, really well, up to about 2011-2012, um, were probably a, a mixture of improved efficiency on the dairy side, um, a reduction in sheep numbers, um, and also uh, quite a significant reduction in fertilizer usage um, over the period from 1998 to about 2011. We saw about a 30% reduction in nitrogen use over that period. Mm -hmm. um, so they, they would have been the main drivers of that uh, decrease, and the, the main uh, causes of the increase since then um, are uh, increased dairy numbers uh, and an increased fertilizer usage. Um, are there any incentives for farmers uh, to reef wet peaty soils? Um, I think at the moment. At the moment, not that I not that I know of, um, but certainly uh, it it is uh, something that should be incentivized. Um, I think, as I said, these are our rainforests and they should be treated as such. Mm. Um, so uh, uh, they should be uh, maintained, the, the, the carbon stocks in them are so high that they uh, need to be maintained uh, and preserved as best possible. Um, is adaptive variation owing to a plant's response to changing climate, climatic conditions and or increasing impact of disease owing to rising temperatures likely to significant, uh, influence, significantly influence our CO2 sequestration? There's a technical question for you. Um, yes, so actually we had a paper out on this uh, a few years back um, where we did see that uh, under rising temperature conditions that uh, it, it could adversely impact on our ability to sequester carbon um, because uh, the relationship between soil temperature and CO2 uh, uh, emissions from soil uh, are uh, exponentially related to each other. Um, on the other hand, as the CO2 levels increase, you also increase uh, the um, water use efficiency of your plants. So they tend to become slightly more drought resistant because they, the pores that open up to let water out and let CO2 in, they don't need to have as many of them. Um, so you sometimes, depending on, get a little bump in yield from the higher CO2 levels. So it's what we call CO2 fertilization effect. So, um, so it, but that's very, very uh, dependent on species, um, etc. So some, uh, some crops uh, respond well to increased CO2, some of them don't respond at all. Um, but they do, will all res respond to elevated temperatures. And what we've seen uh, in drought situations, uh, because we have equipment that measures the carbon balance on a field scale, is we see our grassland sinks flip and become sources of carbon. So the carbon leaving the system in drought situations uh, is higher than the amount of carbon uh, coming into the system which makes sense because like when we had our last drought situation a couple of years ago, um, we had very little grass growth. If you have very little grass growth, you have no sequestration. Gary, there's a question here in relation to the role of the consumer. And this is uh, an area that I um, we've talked about before. Uh, yeah. that, you know, that consume, you know, a lot of, we, we know that a lot of consumer, uh, greenhouse gas emissions are driven by the consumer ultimately. Mm. Um, so the question here is how can we link farm rewarding to consumer purchasing? Um, or this could this be done through a form of farm certification uh, which would influence uh, consumer buying behavior or maybe, maybe you've seen other schemes from other countries, Gary. I'm not sure, have you seen work 
of works going on in this yeah, area? So it was actually a large part of the, of the IPCC's uh, special report on land and climate change. Um, so what we tend to see is that if you look at the kind of fork emissions associated um, with the production of anything, uh, any commodity from agriculture, uh, what we tend to see is that about 30% of the emissions are associated with food waste, as in, uh, and that's, that could be food waste across the, the whole uh, chain. So it could be food, it could be wastage at the farm level, uh, it could be wastage at the retailer level where they throw out food, uh, or it can be wastage at the consumer level where they um, where they buy food. And, and that that seems to be no matter where you go across the globe, uh, somewhere around about thirty percent. So it's quite high. Um, what I would say uh, the problem we probably have with demand side measures is that we export uh, most of what we produce. So it's, it's not our behavior that needs to be changed. So we can change our behavior in this country and that will have a, a, a certain amount of an effect, but about 80 to 90% of what we're producing is going abroad. So it's somebody else's behavior we need to change. Uh, how you do that multilaterally um, uh, I, is difficult. I mean, World Health Organization, the FAO, do have kind of blueprints for healthy diets and uh, this sort of thing, and dematerian diets where you eat less meat. Um, but really, um, you know, in terms of having an, an impact on our emissions, um, you're really talking about other countries' um, emission profile, not, not or other countries' um, uh, uh, behaviors. Okay, it's a, consumers. Aren't, uh, most of them aren't in this country that are eating the produce. Yeah, that's, that's a fair point. Um, Gary, we're getting a lot of questions around protected urea, um, and yeah. there's some mixed, I suppose, understanding around uh, protected urea. Can you, and, and this will be our final question, um, can you just give us some clarity around the okay. uh, concerns that have been raised around uh, protected urea? Okay, so what we define as protected urea is urea that has been coated with uh, a chemical called MVPT, okay, or Agrotain, which is its, um, its, uh, its trademark uh, name. Um, the product, um, we work very well uh, in a grassland context. Uh, in a cropland context, we didn't see any differences uh, between protected urea and calcium ammonium nitrate uh, in terms of nitrous oxide. And that's because on, on most uh, crop lands, uh, nitrous oxide emissions tend to be very low anyway. Uh, and that's a consequence of them having uh, low carbon stocks. They tend to be on sandier, uh, more free draining soils. So there tends to be not very much nitrous oxide associated with, uh, with um, uh, fertilizer application to crop plants. Um, However, on grasslands, um, the, the product that we used uh, uh, was extremely effective uh, at reducing nitrous oxide emissions and has much lower ammonia emissions. Then, so it, it, it behaves much more like a CAM product than a urea product. Um, again, there are, there are density and spreading issues uh, around it, which is why uh, in a cropland situation where you have quite large bout widths, um, we wouldn't necessarily uh, recommend it in all situations there. But certainly in terms of um, uh, use on grasslands, um, we've seen uh, no problems now. I mean, the, some of the issues around some of the protected urea products may be that they are being, uh, that the agrotain is being coated locally. Uh, the urea is being bought in, it's being coated, um, and depending, depending on the solvent uh, that's being used to coat the agrotain on, you may or may not, I think there was, there was a, a couple of cases maybe where uh, some of the fertilizer was sticking to the on the on the spreader. Um, but in general, uh, and we use it on our farms in Johnstown and in Moorpark, uh, we, we haven't seen any problem with it. Really. 
so there might be some initial quality variations there that um, it, 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 there may be there may be some quality variations from manufacturer to manufacturer okay gary look uh, the time has run out on us thank you for your, your time today and a really excellent presentation we've had lots of questions in from uh, our viewers today uh, that we haven't had a chance to get to all of them so we may get the opportunity uh, at a later stage to address some of those and and those please anybody who's listening your questions uh, aren't being uh, being put in a drawer uh, for you know they will be we, we will be looking at those questions and seeing how can we actually develop maybe a further webinar to address some of them uh, just before we we sign off i uh, just want to show you uh, that there are that there is a whole list of additional um additional uh, webinars coming up in may uh, next week i'll be speaking to uh Donald or Joe Patton uh, on feeding management for productive ruminants, and uh, and then we'll have an industry perspective uh, from Joe Crockett of Dairy Sustainability Ireland, and so and then Jack Nolan from the Department of Agriculture on the eighth of May. So you can view all of those, and also you can view the previous webinars uh, by clicking on the links uh, within the uh, the Chagas website. Just go to Chagas and look at events. Also, if you haven't done so already, uh, you can go and visit the Chagas Connected website and we've just launched a new uh, Chagas Connected Digital uh, version. So you'll be getting, you can avail of monthly updates from Chagas uh, in relation to events and upcoming training and, and newsletters. So just click on join today and you can put in your details and insert your areas of interest uh, that uh, you'd like to get updates on. So uh, with that, I'd like to again thank Gary for his time today and uh, his excellent presentation, which will be available uh, later on, hopefully today, to download. I also want to thank um, our backroom team, Andy Boland, Pat Murphy, and Yvonne Marr, and uh, also remind you that at the end of this webinar, you'll be asked to complete a short survey. We would really appreciate any comments and feedback that you'd have, and also ideas on future webinars that you'd like to future topics that you'd like to hear about so with that i'd like to thank you for listening uh, stay safe and uh, we hope you enjoy the weekend thanks very much you've been listening to the podcast version of the chagas signpost series the weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in irish farming don't forget to join us live every friday morning for our latest webinar for more visit chagas.ie and you can also rate, review, and subscribe to the Signpost series on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts from. I'm Mark Gibson, and thanks for listening.